Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Luke. It's a very, very interesting series, at least I think so. This is the lesson number 10 in that series entitled, Following Jesus in Everyday Life. Sounds like they're trying to make this series pertinent to us, right? Well, um, I hope you have your Bibles handy. We'll be looking especially at chapters 11, 12, 18, 19, 22 of, of Luke. So, you know, mostly in that area. Um, before we begin, however, as usual, we'd like to ask the Lord to guide our discussion. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've come here to seek to understand and discuss your word. As these holy words, these holy ideas are presented, may we represent your character, your Holy Spirit, and your Son in the best possible way. May we think as clearly as possible about these issues is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> For those of you who are regular listeners, a couple weeks ago we talked about the mission of Jesus. And this particular lesson asks a very interesting question. Right at the beginning it says, and in that lesson, maybe I just review a little bit, we said that the mission of Jesus involves not just this world, but the entire universe. That God's character has to be correctly represented, and, and, and the falsehoods of Satan have to be proven wrong uh, in the great controversy. But now, this lesson asks, did he also pay the penalty for sin, so that human beings, despite their fallen nature, could be redeemed? What do you think about that question? Uh, what is the penalty of sin, and and who paid it, and to whom was it paid? Sounds like paganism to me. Well, let's not jump there quite that fast. Somebody's got to pay a penalty to to what? To assuage the wrath of an angry God? That's paganism. Yeah. Okay. Is that what's happening here? Why do so many people think it's a penalty to be paid? It's what we've been taught for generations. What we've been taught. In other words, Jesus came and lived and died to appease the wrath of offended God, who's, I think, about uh, Jonathan Edwards back in the early history of the United States. Yeah, to appease the wrath of an offended God. Is that what we're dealing with here? It's either that or legal, some sort of legal statement that yeah. needs to be dealt with. Okay. Is that any better? No. <laughs> Not much. Jim's uh, pretty definitive over there. Yeah, it sounds like it, doesn't it? I've just been reading the book. It, it, helps, it helps me a lot on that one, so. <laughs> okay. Would it be more correct, and would like you all to think about this, would it be more nearly correct, to put it that way, to say that Jesus died to demonstrate the results of sin? Yes. As opposed to paying the penalty for sin? Well, that's one of the issues we need to think about. Well, by living and dying, we've suggested that Jesus intended to create a new family of faith. Now, what's this family of faith? A Christian community will be filled with individuals who choose to live Christ-like lives. Is that possible? Sure. They've been persuaded based upon the evidence that uh, God has been telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came as the ultimate example of, and the ultimate teacher of doing that. You use the term new kin. Um, it's my understanding that there have always been people, mm -hmm. even before Jesus came, who lived lives okay. like this. So why, why are you throwing this term new in well, here? Well, what I see in history is God started out with Adam and Eve. He sort of started over with Noah. He sort of started over with Abraham. He sort of started over with the new Christian church. He, in a sense, started over with the Protestant Reformation. We had been, I think, there was a partial starting over in the events that led up to 1844. I mean, is it, are these new things, or are this just a new wave on the ocean beach, or what, what, what's going on at these times? Humanity down through the ages had a habit of sullying what was 
fairly simple and straightforward what God wanted. And when Christ came here, he had to turn around and start again. And st so how many times does he start over? Well, I mean, that, that's the question. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that making a point if you have to start over so many times? Yeah. Is this a, I mean, is, is, is there sort of an indefinite repetition? As we always wandered off the reservation to put it in the vernacular. <laughs> wandered off the reservation. So, so what's going to keep us from wandering off any other time? Well, that's a good question because we are just about at the point, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we're just about the point where our predecessors have said the conservatives and the liberals sort of, and the church divides. And there are some um, within the church um, theologians within the church uh, who would say something similar to this may have happened and I'm a, if I correct me here there was some similar things may have happened around 1901 yes mm -hmm. some people so would think that general conference in 1888 so and and those yeah there. so are you saying that we're we're starting over when we go this split are we well, starting over some people would say that. Starting over. So it's just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. <clears throat> so one of the one of the big issues and, and clearly those of you who listen to this class and listen to our discussion know that we have a great respect for the writings of Ellen White. Um, one of the things that's happening is that a lot of people are losing all respect for Ellen White, while others are getting more and more respect for Ellen White. And why would that be? Well, it depends on is, that a, is that an evidence that we're going shh? Depends on which side of the fence you're talking to. <laughs> okay. If you're talking to those who are distancing themselves from Ellen White, then they would, they would have one argument. And those who are embracing her a little more, let's as you described, their their argument would be a little different as to what yeah. was happening. So is it is it happening, black and white like this that either you don't like her or you do like her, or is the is the question a little more, uh, more? It's more fluid. Involved than that. than that. Yeah, it's more involved than that. I mean, I've seen some people argue about who she was. Mm -hmm. You know, how much. How much do you take her as infallible versus how much you take her as fallible? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, there's lots of questions, uh, and books have been written about it recently, and, and the books basically don't deal with the most important question, and that's a difficult question, difficult thing to deal with, and that is, was she inspired by God? Of course, then you go into the question of what does that mean? Yes, of course. <laughs> so it just goes Well, on let, me, on. let me just give you some pretty potent words from her. This is in Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 3. And see how this might impact us if, if we actually experience this. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, notice, if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims... So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Now there are some who find great delight in doing God's service and there are others who think, it, think it's pure drudgery. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ. We're talking about living the life like the Christ like experience through an appreciation of the character of Christ. Through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Well, that's an incredible mouthful. How about Jonah? Mm -hmm. was, he was, he was, was, was he was he truly obedient? He was a Not any more than he absolutely had to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it it's, says here, 
How was it? High, the, 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 find its highest delight in doing his service. Mm -hmm. So, this prophet of the Lord here was he? Was he? Was he truly obedient? About Gordon, what do you think? <laughs> I don't think he was. No, he, he was a rebel. <laughs> he rebelliously obeyed, kind of like the um, son, Under the two duress. sons that Jesus talked about. But this this guy's a prophet here. He's a he someone changed. who did what the Lord said. Well, there's other ones like him. What about Balaam? Well, he well, what about, he's different. <laughs> <laughs> what about even our hero Elijah? Yeah, was running away from Isabel. Was that a delight Jezebel. or Jezebel? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Jezebel. I mean, was that a delight? No. I mean, when he was in the cave, kind of sulking, was that a mm -hmm. delight? He was doing everything that the Lord said to do. Mm -hmm. And it well, he, was it except really being a run away? Huh? Except he wasn't supposed to be running away. Well, that was the moment when he was supposed to strike the the iron when it was hot, and he was running. I wonder why. How about before Jonah had this experience and afterward? Of course, we don't have... I guess where I'm leading there is, you know, we've got... <clears throat> we brought up Elijah, who, who... who we are arguing here was not doing God's will at this particular time. But there are the times that he did. There's times... You know, Moses struck something, too. Mm -hmm. He struck the rock, the rock twice when he wasn't supposed to. So... Uh, do you have to be obedient all the time? Is forgiveness part of this obedience? Oh, of course. Thing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, in, 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 the, in the context of the Luke, which is what we're talking about today, the, the opponents to Jesus were what particular group? Pharisees. Mostly the Pharisees. The Pharisees were opposed to the teachings of Jesus almost from day one. The Pharisees were a very conservative group, religious group of Jews who were extremely, extreme legalists. While professing to believe in God's goodness and grace, they lived as if their salvation depended entirely upon keeping the law. So we come to a very interesting passage, Luke 11, 39, starting with Luke 37, Luke 11, 37. When Jesus finished speaking, Jesus has been now giving some speeches. He's on the other side of the Jordan, outside of Judean territory, not in Galilean territory. This is Gentile territory, but there are a lot of Jews who live over there, including some Pharisees. When Jesus finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. The Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus had not washed before eating. So the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of your cup and plate, but inside you are full of violence and evil. Is that a nice thing to say to your host? Fools, did not God make the outside also make the, who made the outside may also make the inside? But give what is in your cups and plates to the poor, and everything will be ritually clean for you. How terrible for you Pharisees! You give God a tenth of the seasoning herbs, such as mint and rue and all the other herbs but you neglect justice and love for God. These you should practice without neglecting the others. How terrible for you Pharisees. You love the reserved seats in the synagogues. And what do we know about the reserved seats in the synagogues? The Jewish synagogues were different than our churches. There was a row across the front that were reserved for the special people. And if you were up there to be seen of men, you were in. Well, is that why people don't like to sit on the front row of the church? <laughs> <laughs> they don't, don't want to seem like Pharisees? Maybe. I don't think that's the only reason. <laughs> I don't think that's it at all. How terrible you are. You are like unmarked graves which people walk on without knowing it. Wow. Mm. One of the teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Jesus answered, How terrible also for you teachers of the law. Okay, you want to bring your name up? I'll talk about you too, right? You put loads on people's backs which are hard to carry, but you yourselves will not stretch out a finger to help them carry these loads. How terrible for you. You make fine tombs for the prophets, the very prophets your ancestors murdered. You yourselves admit then that you approve of what your ancestors did. They murdered the prophets and you build their tombs. For this reason, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets 
and messengers, they will kill some of them and persecute others. So the people of this time will be punished for the murder of all the prophets killed since the creation of the world, from the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the, pray and the holy place. Between the altar and yeah, the hope is, yes, I tell you, the people of this time will be punished for them all. How terrible for you, teachers of the law. You have kept the key that opens a door to the house of knowledge. You yourselves will not go in, and you stop those who are trying to go in. When Jesus left that place, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees began to criticize him bitterly and ask him questions about many things, trying to lay traps for him and catch him, saying something wrong. How successful were they at doing that? Would that be a parallel to Matthew 23, mm -hmm. 23 yes. and following? Yes. And the, these scribes and Pharisees, they had the holy writings. Mm -hmm. And they were misrepresenting. And what was the worst sin we've uh, observed down through history? We got Satan misrepresenting God. We had Moses misrepresenting God when he struck the rock the second time mm -hmm. when he was asked to speak to it. And here he's condemning. People who are misrepresenting God. God. Yeah. yeah, scribes and Pharisees, the Bible translators and the Bible writers and so forth. So. What, what was Jesus saying with all that? It, I mean, he's just talking about behavior there, it looks like, but what is he really saying? Well, that's one of our next section of our lesson. He made seven points. One, you look good from the outside, but you're full of violence and evil inside. What does that mean? Deception. Hypocrites. Yeah. These are the people who, who felt you could get away, anything you could get away without being seen, you, go ahead. Commit an adultery, commit rape, commit so, two. Oh, so go ahead. Isn't, isn't everybody have a degree of that? I was thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but when you think about the high-ranking Pharisees, they lived off the temple, and they lived very well. Uh, you hear about when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, they say they went for the gold. Not exclusively, there was a lot of bullion in that temple that was not on the walls. Oh, yeah. And they made sure they got their cut. They never got their hands dirty, sickling wheat to the ground. No. Well, going on, you tithe even the seasoning herbs such as mint and rue. And I'm sure they made a big deal out of that. They would come with their little bags, you know. Here's my tithe of my mint. Here's my tithe of my rue, and here's my tithe of, you know. That was a tithe system? Did, did they grow the stuff at home or something? Yeah, oh yeah, and, absolutely. Okay, so that's how they'd pay their tithe. Yeah. Tenth of their crops. Well, and, and of course they would bring other things too. That wasn't the whole tithe, but you know, the idea is if you're so particular about, your, about the counting out the seeds, you must be a real saint, right? Well, we're supposed to we were supposed to pay a tithe. Well, so what's the problem? <laughs> yeah. Just because they're they're doing well, it. Well, why are they, why are they doing that? They're doing it for one reason only, and that's to show off. Image. Image. Aggrandizement. Getting back to your question, my translation here, what Christ was doing when you asked why was he doing it in such a situation, the translation here says that all these things down through the ages, the sins were going to be charged against this generation. Mm -hmm. And he was pointing the finger right at them. They can't say they weren't warned. Yeah. I, um, they go on. He talks about the reserve seats in the synagogue. And he just says plainly, you do this to be seen by men, by people. You put heavy loads on people's backs, but you're not willing to lift a finger to help them. We know that you almost had to be independently wealthy to be a Pharisee. You had to fast two days a week, and you had so many things that you were supposed to do if you really, really, really were following all the guidelines. It was like a full-time job, just to, just to practice your religion. Where did the, uh, was there a, a, Le a Levitical um, uh, instructions for the institution of uh, the Pharisees, or was that something that no. they? Well, they they're, contrived they're, later on. Okay, no, there's, a, there's clear instructions in the five books of Moses about what the Levites, that is the priests, were supposed right. to do. Well, they had taken those instructions and just stretched them out and added a million other, I mean, five, I think, what is it, 513 rules for keeping the Sabbath? 613. 613, yeah, some incredible number. 
It's just to keep the behavior right on, though. That's well, what, uh, what it was for. <laughs> well, but, but you, what is the purpose for having all those rules? Working, is, a, working your way to heaven is what it was. Yeah, but what they, the way they used those rules was, look, I do this and you don't. Well, and the Levites were supposed to be uh, uh, a, a heavily servant organization. Yes. Well, I kind of think that Jesus was talking against elitism. Of That's basically what it is, because Pharisees thought that, that they were the most important to God. And Jesus spent a lot of time saying, no, that's not true. He kind of pushed them down and raised up the poor. So to kind of le level it out. So he, he, he winds up by saying this. Remember, he's talking to who? What two groups? The Pharisees and the, teachers. the teachers of the law, the scribes. Okay? He says, you have the key to the door of knowledge. What would that be? Scripture. Scripture. Yeah. But you refuse to go in and you refuse to let others who want to enter. You know, some have accused our church of being somewhat elitist. Yeah. Uh, our people being somewhat elitist over the fact that, uh, quotes, we have the truth. I see. Well, don't we all have the truth in the form of the Bible? Well, but th that's true, but I'm... I'm saying some have accused us, and, per, and, and possibly I'm intimating that maybe, maybe we have, maybe some of us have, have done that. We, mm -hmm. We've got the truth, and so we're better than you but are. None of us would ever love the praise of men. Well, not at this table. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, you've got to admit that people back then looked up at the Pharisees, thought them as blessed of God, that they were, they were being treated with favoritism by God, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. And um, who, who loved it? The people looking no, up at my no, 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 the Pharisees, Pharisees. the yeah. Pharisees. Yeah. But and when was, Jesus comes in and says, "Listen, you're not any better than these guys," and he, he starts going through the seven things, but, and but, and that just really made him mad. But the reason they they looked up to the Pharisees is that somehow that is what the Pharisees teaching. taught taught the people was to be the situation. Well, isn't that the, the way it is with everything? Well, I hold mean, on. Even the pagan religion <laughs> is like that. Hold on. Even the pagan religion yeah. has, has priests that are favored by the pagan gods. Okay. Let's talk about us. Oh, now you're going to meddling. <laughs> we claim to be the people who have the three angels' messages. And we claim that we're going to spread those three angels' messages to the whole world. May I read you a couple of verses? Then I saw another angel fly high in the air with an eternal message. This is not a new message. This is not invented by Seventh-day Adventists. An eternal message of good news to announce to the people of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Does that sound like an elitist message? It's supposed to go to everybody, right? Well, you haven't said what the message is. Yeah, no, I'm just a asking you so. if it's supposed to go to everybody, it's, we shouldn't be saying, well, it's just for us, right? At least that much? Mm -hmm. Okay, honor God. He said in a loud voice, honor God, or fear God in the King James, and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Springs of water. Sorry. Water. Okay, so do we... Uh, are we elitist because we believe that we have this special message? Well, we become elitist when we think we're better than everybody else because we have anything. Making it what we have, this message or anything else. It depends what the message is, though. If the message is anti elitist, well, then it is an elitist, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, well, the probably. Look at look what Jesus did. He died on the cross. He basically died a slave death. That's what he did. A and traitor. there was no... And then when people found out that this person who died a slave death was God, mm -hmm. well, that, that changed their whole idea of who God was. Mm -hmm. 
and all of a sudden everybody was loved by God. That's, that was a wonderful message that came out, and that's what Paul preached as he went, went to the Gentiles. And Paul says, study his life. Mm -hmm. that's where you're going to get healing. And the healing is for your mind to change your conception of God. Well, there's some kind of a relationship here between fearing God or honoring God and what we call faith. What's that relationship? Fear God or what? Faith. Faith. <clears throat> I, I'd like to read some words from a very good friend of mine. Based on all of scripture, a biblical definition of faith, stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. So faith is what? Relationship. Faith is a relationship with God. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. Why, do we, why can't we say will be? Turn it down. The example of Lucifer. Look at the example of Lucifer. Yeah. Nobody should have known God better than Lucifer, and yet he still turned it down. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence. Notice, faith is based on what? Evidence. evidence. The evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we're sure he is the one saying it. To accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that, like Abraham and Moses, God's friends, described like that in the Bible, we know God well enough to reverently ask him, why? So if you're looking for evidence, you need to ask that question, why, right? Is faith then purely a relationship? Sounds like that's what you read there. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's nothing else? It's just a well, relationship? Like I what got else could faith, it be? I got faith in my wife because of my relationship with her? Sure. What about, what about the unseen? How do you deal with the unseen? Don't you deal with that with faith? You well, mean your wife, there's nothing mysterious about your wife? Well, Most wives. That isn't what I'm talking about. You're getting <laughs> off the subject. I'm talking about all the unseen things there are in the universe that the yeah. Bible says there is. Yeah. And we, we have to take it with faith that they really exist. Okay, but why do we take it by faith? Because we, it, that's based on the evidence that we have. Yeah, but it's not only a, the evidence of a person, it's an evidence of other things too, like this but creation. All those, all those things relate to that person. They all relate to that person. That person is the core, the, 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 the source, the, the say, sustainer of all of that. You think that faith is a, you think that the truth is living? The truth will set you free. Well. Is the truth living? It's, it's progressive, it's, it's growing in that sense, yes. Yeah? Well, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, all right. Okay. Something to think about. What about fear? We have that word fear in those first angels' message. What, what, what does fear mean in a biblical sense? To be in awe of God. To be in awe on God, to reverence God, to honor God. Respect. Respect. Yeah, there's a lot of verses in the Bible, starting from Job 28, 28. God said to human beings, to be wise, you must have reverence for the Lord. To understand, you must turn from evil. So in the modern, many of the modern translations, the word re uh, fear doesn't appear. It's reverence or mm -hmm. honor or respect. Mm -hmm. And that's, pro I think that's uh, good translations. So now the question comes, if we claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, as one of the forms of Christianity, can we explain the third angel's message without creating any fear? That's something for you to think about. Well, you should um, read what it is. 
I mean, it's, you just you want me to read what it's <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's it's do that. In the, can you read the book of floating. Revelation without? I think, yeah. I think you can, but the implications are rather serious if you choose to turn your back on it. Yeah. And it's an individual thing when it comes down to it in the end. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just read it, take a moment or two. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, this is Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives the mark of the, on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. And then some would include verse 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. So, you know that many of our Christian friends have read that as one of the main reasons why they believe in hellfire. Is that what it's teaching? In a word, no. <laughs> in a word, no. And the reason they've done that is they've subscribed to the lie told by the serpent in the uh, Garden of Eden in chapter 3 of, of Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. So their presupposition is you step out of line, God will kill you. Mm -hmm. Well, but you must admit, when you read the way the phrasing and <clears throat> the specifics are of that particular text, there's it, a it, 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 there must be something before and after there we need to get. Exactly. <laughs> what, what we're saying is, if you haven't read the rest of the Bible, you shouldn't be reading the third angel's message. You have to read the definitions of the words in that passage, and you have to get them from Genesis to Revelation, and then you can read this passage well, with complete but then, confidence. But, but if that's the third angel's message, and that's quotes the, 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 a significant purpose for the existence of the Adventist church. Are we going to go out and have everybody read the Bible from front to back before we have them read that little passage? Well, that there? would be Hopefully. wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> would you start to say, Gordon? Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> well, we better have a chat with some of our evangelists then. <laughs> well, how are we supposed to respond to God's care? Remember, he cares for us so much he has numbered the hairs on our head. Why would that even matter? Mine are disappearing, I think, very rapidly. <laughs> what, how, does, how does understanding the truth about God impact us? Look at the difference between Peter, the night Jesus was tried, and he's cussing and swearing that he doesn't know Jesus. And a few weeks later, he's standing up, Acts 4, starting from about verse 8 or somewhere in there up to verse 13. He's standing in front of the Congress of his day, the Sanhedrin, and said, you are the ones who killed the Son of God. And these miracles that we are performing are in his name. I mean, it's hard to imagine how you could be bolder than that. What, what happened to Peter? He had a paradigm shift. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In the right so the direction. Whole picture. Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously he hadn't forgotten all that Christ told them in their wanderings around. I think that's pretty good too. Yeah. Well, let's look at another passage. Luke 12. The parable of the rich fool. fool I'm assuming you all are somewhat familiar with this story. A man in the crowd said to Jesus, Teach, uh, Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. Jesus answered, My friend, who gave me the right to judge or to divide between the property between you two? And he went on to say to them, Watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed. Do we ever see any greed in our world today? <laughs> because a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns, no matter how rich he may be. And then he tells a story about the rich fool who has a huge bumper crop, and he says, I got a problem here. I, I don't have room in my barn, so I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And God says, what? Tonight your life will be, will be charged to you and, and he dies and he's not even able to enjoy any part of those, the bumper crop he got. Well, did God say that because he made the bigger barns? What do you think? What? 
I don't know. I asked you the question. <laughs> Turn it around on me. <laughs> what I get over here is, is the rich man had his priorities all mm. out of whack. Yeah. So he should have, what? Well, what, what Jesus what is saying is. basically is if, if you live a self-centered life, you're just not going to fit in heaven. That's what he's saying. So the man should have given it to the poor, given it to the church, At least some sold it, it yeah. given the money to the poor. Mm -hmm. You remember what he said to that rich young ruler who came to him and said, okay, you want to know how you can be really saintly? So what you have and give it to the poor. And why was that such a, an absolutely unthinkable thing for the rich young ruler? What was their usual thinking in those days? If you're well off and appear to be blessed, it's because, God, and because of your riches. God's smiling on you. You yeah. must be... Must be a good must man. Be good. Yeah. yeah. Obvious, isn't it? So Jesus is saying... Lead. If you become a sinner, God will bless you. I mean, that's what they sort of interpret. This, that can't be right. It can't be right. Well, that's what the, Job's four friends basically said to him. Yeah. Look at yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Health is gone and your wealth is gone. You must be a sinner. Yeah, and, and, and they Just went up. a plea and, and that'll settle it. In another class, we're studying the book of Job right now. and They got to the place where they said, your children were killed because they deserved it. They must have been terrible sinners. I mean, imagine saying that with absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. But yet they were thorough, these four theologians were thoroughly convinced that they were correct. They believed that they were representing the truth about God. I want to go back to Jonah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah's not a very good example, but let's... Well, he was... Uh, pretty successful uh, evangelist. That's right. There appears to be probably one of the greatest evangelists of all time, except perhaps for Jesus. And I guess maybe you could throw Paul in there and maybe Peter. But wouldn't you say that the message... I, 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 it would appear to me that when Jonah arrived in Nineveh, he was kind of preaching the third angel's message, a judgment hour message. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to work. So what was my question after that? How He didn't go in there... Of course, we do not. We don't have his sermons recorded. No. We have very little. About four words or something. Right, right. Um, and he was very for a very short period of time. It appears. Mm -hmm. um, he 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 didn't go in there preaching. Well, I'm going to assume that, that you have to know the Bible front to back and all of this stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. Is the is the third angel's message um, another question, I guess, but I'm not sure I even have my thought clearly presented. The third angel's message, is that, is that uh, a specific, is that a message specific for our time, or is that a, is that a message for all time? It's specific for our time. Mm -hmm. It's because it's in response to Satan's mark of the beast. But, in chapter but 13. But certainly aren't there overtones to almost any of those prophets who came along, Elijah and Jonah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. Well, well, Wait, there are things to learn from Jesus them, yes. referred to the garbage dump. He says you don't want to go to destruction. The garbage, uh, Gehenna, the, the yeah. uh, south of uh, Jerusalem there. So uh, that's all, God raises his voice to try to get people's attention, I think. Ellen White in another place, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 460, says, Vigilance and fidelity have been required of Christ's followers in every age. But now that we are standing upon the very verge of the eternal world, holding the truths we do, having so great light, so important a work, we must double our diligence. What does that mean? Work even more. Mm -hmm. Are we always keeping our minds and our eyes focused on the kingdom of God? Are we making sure that no earthly attractions will ever take our eyes off Jesus? Or do we allow our Christianity to be sort of lax and lethargical? Well, a picture that comes to mind is a very narrow focus in one's life. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's an improper interpretation and application, but... Would you, would you say a focus on Jesus is a narrow interpretation? Well, I guess what I'm saying is uh, when reading that and thinking about f absolutely focusing on that all of the time, we would almost 
describe someone as a as fanatical. Yeah. How how far? So what is the correct, correct? It was the correct interpretation of uh, this kind of a passage. I well, was. here's here's a balancing act. We have been warned repeatedly that he will show up like a thief in the night. The only safety then is to be constantly ready. But there's a greater motive than that should affect all of us. And I quote once again from Ellen White. This is found in Review and Herald, August 2 of 1881. The shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us through fear to right action? This ought not to be. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. In other words, our Christianity should be an excited, loving response to what we see in the life and death of Jesus. Isn't there some parallel to that in the great controversy toward the back there? Some parallel to that statement? I, I've, maybe my memory is yeah. fading, but... <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to see what, what problem's being solved there. Because you're, you're, you're kind of reading an answer, but I don't know what the problem was that she's dealing with. The problem is that there are some people who want to come up and say, scare you to death. Jesus could come tomorrow. You might, I mean, I was told as a, as a child, mm -hmm. you better behave yourself because you don't know when your name is coming up in the, in the, king, in the, in the courts of heaven. That's and, and then she's saying what to solve that? that? She's saying that that kind of scaring, trying, well, and I jokingly put it this way, if you'll excuse the language, you can't scare the hell out of people. Literally. Yeah. You can't. Playing on people's fear, and mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, that's basically a self-centered position. But then, fear then fear is only it? a very temporary motivator. How, do, how does diligence come into this then? Well, she's saying that the diligence means to study the life of Jesus. Look at his example every day and say, how can I be more like Jesus? If we do that, we're, we'll be safe. Well, that's what Paul says. Yeah. If we, that's that's the key to being saved, and that's what Jesus yeah. says in in John and uh, what John six and John seventeen, and of course several other places, but uh, in particular. What what would happen if we actually lived a Christ-like life in the twenty first century? Well, if you show me a person who has, well, then maybe I can answer that. <laughs> I mean, all you could do is speculate. Yeah, well, of course, you know, people. There's some famous. Job? Job was a declared a righteous and upright man. You know, the, all those people are stories. Even Jesus is a story, yeah. if you really think about it. So when you ask well, that question, well, what, what we can I say? We are the most privileged people in the most privileged time in history than, that's ever, ha ever occurred. We have more truth available to us in more easily accessible uh, formats and so forth. I mean, look, at I've got all this... I've got how many, 50 or 100 Bibles or 200 Bibles on my computer here. Well, in having this great light you're talking about and this important work, we must double our diligence. Does that mean uh, that uh, I shouldn't take time to take that uh, cruise to Alaska that I've, well, been, that I've been kind of thinking would be kind of nice to do? Or Well, you could, you could take a cruise to Alaska and enjoy the great works of God. I mean, the question is, why are you taking the cruise to Alaska? I mean, and I, 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 let's not get off to that right. question because the, the <laughs> question, the real question is, we live in the we we live in the lap of luxury, if you will, in terms of revelation about, about God and and for God. Are we living lives that that suggest that we are an all-out war with the devil? Because that's the other side of this. The problem is, is the question. Yeah. Is the question whether or not what we're doing is right or wrong, or is it more in a relationship kind yeah. of thing that whatever you do, whatever you have, how you use it and why you use it in the way you are is what we're really looking at here. Yeah. There, there's people that are extremely wealthy that do absolutely marvelous things with their money. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily in a religious sense, mm -hmm. but in a very moral sense, very mm -hmm. ethical and moral sense, um, that 
maybe would top some of the things that I might do mm -hmm. or we might do uh, under the name of, of religion. Well, I think we need to look at you know, what is the underlining goal that we're trying to reach? And if we Remote. have that relationship with God, then there isn't going to be such a struggle. There's not going to be a big question about it. It's going to be an automatic. Mm. This is just something that needs to be done with my goods, whatever those things might be. Yeah. Well, and that's very, very well put, I would say. Sometimes we're inclined to think, well, I'm not going to try to do preach the gospel in that place or to that group of people or whatever because, you know, I'm not too sure about them. Maybe they don't really want to be saints anyway. You know, God has never given us the, the, the responsibility to be judges. We're supposed to, remember the, the parable, we're supposed to scatter our seed and let God be responsible for how it comes up and how, what it yields. And I have been very surprised, I will say, sometimes at, in my clinic where I see patients all the time, at some of the people who respond to, you know, a prayer. You offer a prayer for them. You know, there's these people you think, man, these people are hard as nails, and they're crying, you know. So that's one of the points. We, we, it's not our job to judge. Um, and then the question is a reward. Hebrews tells, a, that, tells us that Moses avoided the pleasure or left the pleasures of sin for a season. Um, how are we doing on that? Are we leaving aside the pleasures of sin? And I mean, to be honest, is there any, any kind of pleasure that we could possibly imagine here on this earth that would even come close to living forever with God in the, in the future kingdom? I mean, honestly. I think it's uh, quite easy for, whole, for most of us at some time or another. We're quite comfortable with what we've got. Mm -hmm. We pay lip service to the higher things, and I think most of us try, but it's, uh, it's not an easy road at times. Yeah. You know, the pleasure of sin, sometimes, you know, the first thing that pops into your mind is all this neat stuff you get to do, you know. But, but the pleasure of sin is actually just, just having a season forgetting about God. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at the end, it's just a short season. So why, why is that attractive to people? Why is that attractive to people? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of places you go that don't mention God at all. And they're in a, mm -hmm. It's kind of, a, kind of a fun place, it seems like, for a while. Yeah, and I think that's what Moses understood that that those places they they look fun, but they only last for a little while. I like the way you define that. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pleasure of, of sin is it's a place you go to get away from God. I, I think yeah. that's a, a very uh, a very good well, way to phrase it. Okay, let's 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 follow that. In the kingdom of heaven, everyone who's there will be loving. Each one of us will be looking for opportunities to serve others, and we will be doing that for the rest of eternity. Why shouldn't we begin practicing that kind of love here and now? Well, Selfish people would be totally unhappy in heaven. That's right. Isn't that happening because God is within you? Yeah. He's yeah. in your temple, so to speak, and that's what's kind of causing it. Mm -hmm. If you're away from God, He's nowhere we, in your temple, and you're going to be doing whatever, whatever. Well, listen to these words. Satan sees that his, this is at the very end of, you know, history. Satan sees, this is from Great Controversy, page 670, paragraph 2 and following. Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. It would be hell for a person that doesn't want to listen and take instruction. And it's and self-centered, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So the very essence of Satan's kingdom is selfishness. And the very essence of God's kingdom is love. And w w every day we make a choice. Do we choose to act in selfish ways or do we choose to act in loving ways? I think selfishness is probably the... the 
the way that he got to where he's at, where he hates God. He just hates him. Mm -hmm. So whenever he sees him, it's just it's just a fire to him. Mm -hmm. His anger goes up. Everything, just when you see God, when God comes, when God says he brings his anger, he's just bringing himself. That's yeah. all he's doing. And then Satan just, it just blows makes up. Him so angry. It just yeah. makes him so angry. Well, and then thinking about this kingdom, we're going to talk about it more maybe next week, but Jesus said that true leadership involves servanthood. Now think of the military and political leaders that have been most prominent down through the generations. How many of them were truly servants? Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Genghis Khan, I mean... They were into power in a big way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's one of the problems even in today's world where the in the United States we seem to be dissatisfied with our government and much of of the response is because they're not working for us, they're not listening to us, they're not our servants. Yeah. We wanted them to listen to us and to do our will and in consequence they're doing their own. And yeah. Is it really very much the same way it's always been. Is it possible to go into politics and run for public office without having at least some level of self-centeredness? Exactly. <laughs> I don't think it's exactly. impossible. I don't you know, know. What? Yeah, it's self-defeating. Yeah. Let's and let's let's look at the other side of that coin because that's a very pertinent question. Why was it so difficult for Jesus to teach this principle to his disciples? Remember that as they're entering the upper room to have that final meal with Jesus, they're arguing about which one of them is going to be greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> Adults. I mean, you know. Well, actually, they're arguing who's going to be the most favored of God. Well, in their version of things, yeah. Well, that's that's kind of what it is, and that's kind of how it always was in that paradigm. Could we live in the 21st century in our dog-eat-dog -dog world a completely loving kind of life? Of course. I don't know. There's some <laughs> discipline that needs to happen too which doesn't seem very loving even with God I see isn't so how what, can you tell isn't right? that what God is asking for mm -hmm. can we be certain whose side we're on in the great controversy Ellen White puts it this way in Steps to Christ page 58 paragraph 2 who has the heart with whom are our thoughts of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. How many of us live those kind of lives? What's the antidote if you aren't? Well, I will just have to tell you my personal experience, and I'm certainly not setting my setup up as an example for anybody, but I find that the more I study the life of Christ and the more I study the Bible, the more interesting it becomes to me. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't have time to look at it, you don't have time to think about it, it becomes, I'm sorry, it's, this is not even fun. I don't want to do that. And I think that's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Another quotation, this is Education, page 309, paragraph 1. In our life here, earthly, sin-restricted, though it is, the greatest joy and the highest education are in service. And in a future state, untrammeled by the limitations of sinful humanity, it is in service that our greatest joy and our highest education will be found. Witnessing, and ever as we witness learning anew the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. So how do we treat the other members of our church or the other members of our church around the world? Do we say, well, I, I, I'm going to associate with these people over here, but I'm not going to associate with those people. We're all God's children. 
takes a bit to remember that sometimes. Do we, have, have we come to understand what it really means to follow Jesus? Think of the change, we've already mentioned this briefly, but think of the change that happened in these disciples. They left everything to follow him, really believing they were going to be the next band of politicians running the country, right? Mm. And what happened? Virtually every one of them ended up a martyr, and they were happy to do it. What happened to them people, to those people? The fact that the beginning, their motives weren't that great then, right? No. But it looks like. But Jesus saw in them their character mm -hmm. and um, took them anyway. Yeah. Well, Jesus, fairly early in his career, started talking about something that must have been a real puzzle to the disciples. He said, take up your cross and follow me. And they're thinking, What? What do they know about crosses? Crosses were for traitors to the Roman government. That's what they were for. To destroy the lives and, 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 and absolutely scare people to death against rebelling against the, against the Roman Empire. That's what they were for. It wasn't just that. It was being a bad slave, too, could get, get you on the cross. Well, yeah. You, not doing it's things really, right. It, it was it was really against you had to do something against the Roman government to really get. No, I don't think that was it all of, all the way. Mostly. Mm. So what about it? Uh, do our lives today represent more the attitude of Pharisees, or more or is it more like the attitude of Jesus? Can't just imagine Jesus entrusting the spread of the gospel to this band of at that point in time disheartened, scared to death. Disciples. And here we are in our day. What are we doing? Remember that devil, one of the devil's most successful ploys is not to get us to believe that God doesn't exist or say, you know, spit in God's face. All he has to convince us to do is delay. There's no rush. It's not time yet to get ready. I mean, Jesus isn't here yet, right? Just take it easy, relax. What's the big rush, right? One of the greatest successes of Satan, and let's not be a part of it. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of talking about you, of studying your word. May it be a blessing to us and to all those who look in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.